So, do you want to know if the Book of Mormon is true? If the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is indeed God's one true church on the earth? And that the first vision was true? Well, this isn't about the first vision. I've got other really good videos on that. But by the end of this particular video, with the help of the three Mormons, we ought to be able to figure out if the Book of Mormon is actually true or not. Let's get into it. And truth is knowledge of things as they are, and as they were, and as they are to come. Whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of that evil one. That's out of section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, <clears throat> about verse 21 or so. Well, if truth is eternal, why are these three Mormons trying to convince us something different than what the LDS Church was known for in years past? Why are they such image creators? Why are they on a crusade to convince us that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is becoming more and more like evangelical Christianity? Let's take a look and see what these three try to convince us of the, uh, and the techniques that they use in this, uh, in this latest episode. They're going to be talking about the Book of Mormon and their favorite Book of Mormon stories and they're going to convince us how Christian the LDS Church is and how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they're going to blur the lines between Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. In fact, they're not even going to use the name Heavenly Father. I don't think they're going to use it even once. And that is a big difference between Mormons and Christians. Mormons say Heavenly Father and Christians say God. Let's watch the language and the messages that they're going to give us in this episode. One chapter of the Book of Mormon is the entire Book of Satan. You are proof texting. You, you are proof texting using one part to expound on many parts. So the Jesus of the Bible. You're trying to prove to me with three pages that Jesus is the Christ. I can prove to you in four hours. Sorry, Pastor Forsyth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> simplest terms possible, the Book of Mormon is another record that talks about Jesus Christ and God and his gospel, but it was written in America. Mm -hmm. It's the record of the ancient indigenous Americans who... Can I call them? Too far. Too far? That was too far, Kwaku. I'm just sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's a record of, of the different civilizations in the Americas yeah. and their dealings with God and prophets and Christ. It's wonderful. Oh, the subtlety of these three. They are pretty good at what they do. So they start off with that uh, Christian stuff, pretending that they are Bible-bashing Christians, talking about the Book of Mormon, kind of in a mocking way, uh, in a big joke. And now they're going to start sharing about the Book of Mormon. And what is the Book of Mormon? Well, Quaku starts to say that it's the record of the Native Americans, essentially. But then Ian says, no, no, you're going a little bit too far. And so he says, okay, there are, uh, you know, people that had ancient civilizations in the Americas. Why is that? Why are we differentiating there? Well, because of the DNA studies showed basically that the Lamanites don't exist. So the church has come off the position that we've had in the Book of Mormon, the preface that said that, um, you know, the, the Lamanites were the primary ancestors of the American Indians. Now, since 99.5%, 99.4% of you know, Native Americans tested showed that their ancestry is actually from Siberia, they're, they're, not, you know, they're not Israelites. They're, they didn't come from Jerusalem. And these Lamanites basically aren't anywhere to be found. And the Book of Mormon, of course, states that the land you know, was preserved for them to have alone, that the Lord God would uh, protect it from the, from, from the knowledge of other nations because other nations would overrun the land. And so this was to be the inheritance of the Nephites and Lamanites, you know, the children of Lehi, uh, so that they could possess the land unto themselves. That's, you know, that's, I'm quoting right out of the Book of Mormon. But the church now is telling us that they must have just disappeared into a vast existing population. Of course, the only way we had a vast existing population, uh, you know, before the Jaredites came would be if the flood of Noah never happened. And if these people came across long before Adam left the Garden of Eden. So, um, they try to not really dwell exactly on the details because it wipes out the entire uh, Genesis story. And LDS theology has confirmed that 
that that is definitely um, what they're basing the religion upon. So it's a it's a huge problem. So they they try to they try to blur the lines of historicity there in the subtle. Book of Mormon stories is of a man. His name is Enos. Um, he's the son of a very famous prophet named Jacob. But he, I think he's kind of in his shadow. At the time, he wasn't a prophet. He was still the son of Jacob. And he, like many of us, felt like a minor character in the story of the world. But there's this moment where he says, I was walking in the woods hunting, and I thought to myself about like the words of my father. And he, I thought of all the good things of God, and it made me feel good, and I, I noticed how I wanted to learn more about that. And so this story is all about prayer, and it's about him kneeling down and praying to the Lord. And in the scriptures, we're so used to prophets seeing the face of God or having these wonderful revelatory experiences. Mm -hmm. But in order for Enos to have his revelation, it literally says that he had to wrestle with God. And like, I kind of want to talk about that. Now, like, okay. each one of us can have moments where we really have to wrestle with a question or wrestle with, you know. Yeah, and that be said, so, with a question. Um, he wasn't physically, there was, this was not a WWE in heaven. He was saying this more <laughs> I love the fake acting, the fake laughter. I mean, how many times did they have to make that take to, to look that genuine? Was it really that funny? Was that genuine? Or are these guys acting? What does that tell us about the sincerity of their message? Like I said, they've got an agenda and they're good at what they do. And I think we'll find out that they're very well funded. Like maybe through the more good foundation. What is the More Good Foundation? Who funds it? Some very well-to-do LDS folks. It's maybe an arm's length deal from the church leadership itself. So they're supposed to be coming off as total hipsters, really cool. They're marketing to children, basically, and uh, making the Book of Mormon look cool, and they are totally Christian, and it's hip to be Christian and Mormon. That's the message that's coming across here. The uh, information uh, on the More Good Foundation business, I believe, was uh, researched out by... Uh, wrestling, not Greco-Roman. Yes, yes. But well, we're talking about spiritual wrestling. Yes. True. I think, like, in all of our lives, like, we hit that moment where we're like, yeah. wait, what do I actually believe? Like, does God actually hate me because of all these bad things I've done? Like, where am I with him? And so I really like that story, yeah. how, like, he goes and he prays and he wants to know, like, where am I? Like, what do you think about me? And, like, he's worried because he's made mistakes, like we all yeah. have. And I love that he, like, says in the, in the story how he's like, and, like, I was tormented because of all the, like, dumb things that I'd done and, like, wanted to know if God forgave me and whether, like, I would, if I was going to hell or whether I was going to be okay. And so I like that because I think all of us hit that moment in our life where we're like, wait, like, what does God really think of me? Like, I've done these things. What do I do now? I hit that moment on my mission. There was a moment on my mission where it was about 10 months in and I realized I was, you know, just basically saying air. Like, there was no substance to my testimony when I was saying, and I testify that Jesus lives. It was a written sentence. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's important to understand that in order for us to really come closer to God, we have to realize, what is the foundation of our testimony? Is it really rooted in the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ? Yeah. And I can imagine Enos thinking the same thing, like, oh, I'm the prophet's son. I can do whatever I want, mm -hmm. and I'm good. But then you think to yourself, what is my standing before the Lord? I, I love the idea of wrestling with God because in, the, in our church we use the word revelation a lot yeah. in terms of getting our messages from Heavenly Father but other churches a lot of them call it having a relationship with God Yeah, that's so we, we have a relationship with God we have a relationship with Christ but we, we just use different words sometimes mm -hmm. um, and you can Enos wrestling is two ways you know Yeah. so he he's like has questions of the Lord and the Lord gives them back and it's going back and forth and, and that's a relationship we're saying that's yeah. that's someone's testimony growing and that's their knowledge of him increasing it's really cool because then Enos he realizes that oh I am forgiven of my sins the Lord is aware of me and then he starts praying for his brethren I love that I think like for me whenever I've like done something wrong like I feel like an inner wrestle inside and it's like I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good about the world around me. And I'm like so inward focused. But like the moment that I pray and I like ask for forgiveness for my sins and like feel like that peace come over me that I'm sure he felt. It's just like, 
okay. Like, yeah. I want the whole world to have this. And I know that's why he prayed for his brothers is because he's like, I don't want them. Like, I want them to feel this way that I feel. Praise, hallelujah, amen. Amen, brother. Have you ever heard that at an LDS church? I mean, am I right or what? They are pouring it on. They're pouring it on thick. It's all about Mormons. Mormons, they're Christians now, you know? <laughs> I mean, they are Bible-banging Christians. And we're here to prove it. And we're cool, too. So, what is, uh, what was her name? Keisha or Keys or something? Girl in the middle. She's kind of, she's new to the crew here. So, what, what was she doing? What was, she, what, was, what was her mission right there? She's talking about how she feels bad about all of her sins, just like Enos did. And Enos needed a relationship with the Lord. The Lord. Who is the Lord? Well, that's interesting, because they've talked about a relationship with the Lord, uh, talking to the Lord, back and forth in this wrestle with the Lord. Well, isn't the Lord supposed to be Jesus Christ? In Mormonism, the Lord is supposed to generally be Jesus Christ, not God the Father or Heavenly Father, as he's usually differentiated by. But we're blurring the, blurring the lines here really intentionally because a lot of Christians believe in the Trinity. And we're blurring it here. Um, the Book of Mormon was very Christian in the way it was written because the Lord represented God the Father and Jesus Christ. And we're, she's going to get into her story, and so I'm going to spend a little more time on that when we get there. But they're talking about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. How do you have a relationship if you don't talk to him? Because Mormonism is not about praying to Jesus Christ. Mormons do not worship Jesus Christ or pray to Jesus Christ. According to the last time I read in Mormon doctrine, at least, Bruce McConkie was very explicit saying that, you know, there's one God that we worship, it's God the Father, and he is not Jesus Christ. Okay, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ because he is the mediator, but we don't talk to him. We don't have. Yes. So, my favorite story in the Book of Mormon is in the Book of Ether, which is uh, kind of randomly at the end of the book, but it actually happened way before any of the rest of the Book of like Mormon. 2,000 years. Yeah. So, you guys all know about the Tower of Babel and how they were trying to get to heaven. So, God changes up the languages or whatever, confuses yeah. them, and uh, people that were actually righteous at the time leave because God tells them, like, you need to go. So, they leave, and they're, like, wandering in the wilderness, and they get to this point where they're like, uh, where do we go now? And God tells them, like, all right, you're going to build these barges and go across the sea. And they're like, okay, we're going. First of all, <laughs> imagine yourself asking God, there's this huge ocean over there. I don't know what's on the other side. What do we do? Build a boat. And you're just thinking, like... I yeah. was really hoping you would yeah. say, I was really thinking you could say, stay here. One of the reasons I love it the most, though, is because in that moment... Yeah. He so what is she teaching us there? Hey, it's all about faith. God says, go, I'm going. Just tell me where to go, Lord. I'm here to obey. I'm not here to think for myself. That's what this is all about. So the more faith you have, the more you just listen and obey. And who, who, who did they refer to again? God, God, God. What happened to Heavenly Father? The brother of Jared. That's his name. Sorry, he's his, his main character. Brother. No, it's not even his name. <laughs> he's referred to as the brother of Jared throughout yeah. the book. Did he think he had a really silly name? He did. Mahan Ray Mori <laughs> <laughs> So why are they carrying on and laughing like that? Was it, was it really that funny, or are they acting again? I, I, I'm, have you ever carried on that way when you heard the name Mahonrai Moriankumar? Obviously they're acting. So why is this? Is this another psychological technique? If you laugh at something that's, in other words, they bring it out in the open that it's you know one of these weird Book of Mormon names that Joseph Smith, you know, somehow 
gets into the Book of Mormon, translating it from his brown seer stone or however you believe that he came up with it. But putting this out there and then laughing at it is a great psychological technique so that when you hear it, you're like, oh, you know, yeah, we're, we've already went over that. That's, you know, it, it inoculates you from questioning when you notice things that are you know, sort of weird. But obviously, it wasn't that funny. Quacky is just, you know, he, he's carrying on just, uh, it's, it's like he's the first time he's ever heard that. Can you imagine, after all these years that he's been, you know, LDS, I don't it's not his whole life, but he's heard that name many times, and, and does he react like that every time he hears it? Is there anything these people are doing that's genuine? If not, why not? But yeah, the brother of Jared had all this faith, and God said, go across, and he was just like, yeah, I'm doing it. And so, like, that's why he sees, like, other cool miracles. He's able to see the figure of God, yeah. like, touch stone, so they have light in the boats as they go across. And he's kind of, like, at this point where he's like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I like it because that faith is really what God expects from us. Yeah. He expects us to never ask, like, a thousand questions to just when he says, do it, we're like, okay, I'm on. Once again, it was only a few seconds, but some powerful messages being communicated there and so what happened once again she says hey all of these great things happened because the brother of Jared had faith lots of faith and what was his faith his faith was simply exercised by saying I won't question at anything I'll just obey I'll just obey I'll obey my leader and in his case his leader is God. In your case, it's your priesthood leaders. Don't question, just obey. And that is what brings the miracles. That's what she's saying. And so, there's some other really subtle things in there. Okay, she says, he sees the finger of God because he has all this faith. God? Who is God? In Mormonism, generally, God is the word used for God the Father, Heavenly Father. Once again, God the Father. But what does it say in Ether chapter 3 in this story? Well, when he sees, the, when the brother of Jared, it's an amazing story, and, and we really need to get into it just a little bit. But when he sees, the on that particular point, he sees the finger of the Lord the Lord God. Who is the Lord God? Well, the Lord God identifies himself in Ether chapter 3 verse 14 and he's not the Mormon God. He said, Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. Say what? He's the Christian God. And he stayed the Christian God in Mormonism till about 1835 when Joseph Smith changed things and separated God the Father and Jesus Christ from being the one God. He separated them in Lectures on Faith, lecture number five, when he differentiated and said God the Father is a spirit and Jesus Christ is a resurrected individual. He also said the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit was the mind, combined mind and will of God and Christ. Not an individual, not a person, not a spiritual man, like we have in section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants now, which also promoted God the Father to having a resurrected physical body in section 130. He, he, he got behind Jesus in the uh, LDS plan of uh, exaltation there. He wasn't yet resurrected somehow. He was only a he only had a spirit when Joseph Smith was teaching at that time in the school. Joseph Smith also altered the New Testament in the Joseph Smith translation of Luke chapter 10 in verse 23 in the Joseph Smith translation he states that the Father reveals to you that he is both the Son and the Father. Yeah, so basically Joseph Smith interjects Trinitarianism into the New Testament there in the in that and you used to be able to see it on, on a link from on LDS.org the hyperlink on Luke chapter 10 verse 22 would go to the Joseph Smith translation on verse 23 if you linked from uh, one of the words there you know it'll be highlighted in blue and and it would tell you that that Jesus is revealing 
that he is God the Father and God the Father's, you know, they are one and the same, one and the same being, and which is not what the New Testament says. So he actually uh, Trinitarianized the Bible there. There's tons of it in the Book of Mormon. There's tons that's been taken out of the Book of Mormon. Mary, you know, being the mother of God, and a lot of the corrections that took place to the Book of Mormon. So as far as authenticity goes, we, we've had a developing theology within Mormonism. As Joseph Smith went along, his, his, his teachings about the Godhead uh, evolved from God and Jesus Christ being one and the same person. The Holy Ghost was not a person. The Holy Ghost was basically a, a data bank between these two entities of one person, uh, you know, part of the, the whole Christian thing. Then he evolved into what I, I said, God the Father was a spirit, just like it says in the New Testament. God is spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then, But Jesus was a resurrected individual. And you know, like I said, the Holy Spirit, it was the first time I saw him defined there, was, was as I said. And then, of course, section 130 has got the modern definition of the Godhead, which is, you know, two physically resurrected individuals, and then a, a third individual who is like we all were in the pre-mortal existence in Elias theology. So the gospel of the Book of Mormon is much different from the gospel in the Doctrine and Covenants as it now is. And these three are trying to project that Mormonism is as much like Christianity as they can get it to become here. And never question your leaders, just obey, and that's how the miracles happen, is what she says. Either chapter three is just full of, full of, <laughs> full of stuff that's really problematic for Mormonism, because we learn that Mormonism, you know, we 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 learn in the Doctrine and Covenants, especially language there, and in the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, we learn, you know, there's God has no shadow in changing, and 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 in the in, in the Doctrine and Covenants, He's from everlasting to everlasting. Um, you know, his, his truth and light fill the immensity of space. I mean, he's just perfect. But in the story that she's relating, Jesus just keeps screwing up. First of all, like I said, he, Jesus is God the Father and Jesus. He, he, he's demonstrated that. He lies to the brother of Jared. He tells him he's the first guy that's ever seen him. And we've got other LDS records, actually, that were, I believe, published afterwards at the Book of Moses, you know, where he the Lord is face to face with Enoch in chapter 7 verse 4 talking with him as one man speaks to another and then he builds a city with him or lives in the city with him 365 years all the good people visits the same people that would have been in the city because they're the only righteous ones down in Missouri 240 years after he's been hanging out with them in Doctrine and Covenants section 107 verse 54 the Lord appears at Adam on Diam and blesses Adam and those are all the same people that should have been hanging out with Jesus for the last 240 years. If you look at the chronology, it's just, it's nuts. It's totally nuts. You know, since the city's translated in that same, uh, in that same chapter, translated meaning the people are taken into heaven without tasting of death, all of them. And everybody that's righteous is there. They name all the patriarchs are, are there and all the righteous, you know, uh, descendants of Adam. So those are the people that are already with Jesus. So why does he come down to visit them back in Missouri? You know, in Adam on Diam in Davis County, Missouri, according to section 116. So that's nuts. What's also nuts is uh, the Genesis record has got all these patriarchs, you know, death dates for them, death years for them. And if you look at those death years, they got four generations of guys of patriarchs, these righteous guys that were, you know, worthy of living with the Lord, seeing the Lord, got translated. Four generations of them that die after the date of the city of Enoch being translated. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. You read the, you know, Book of Moses and like chapter 5 and 6, you'll see that. And uh, Joseph Smith just keeps screwing it up. It's ridiculous. So on top of that, and on top of the changing deity there, the changing Godhead, we've got Jesus just can't get it right. So 
The brother Jared has been talking to Jesus. First, he really ticked off Jesus because he didn't talk to him. He didn't pray for like three years or something. So Jesus, you know, squawks at him for a while, and then, then they're cool. They're buddies again when they've been out in the wilderness or hanging out by the seashore or whatever. So he says, build these, build these barges so you can, you can come to America. You know, you can be like Eddie Murphy. Come into America. We're going to make it good for you. So here's how you're going to make these barges. The Lord reveals how to make the barges. And the Lord knows everything. He's from everlasting to everlasting, Alpha and Omega. He knows everything. But the brother of Jared notices that the Lord, God, who's Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son somehow, he's the Christian God, the Christian God doesn't know how to make a barge so that people can survive and function in it. Behold, Lord, we've got some problems here. There's some faults in your design. We can't breathe, and we can't see. And we're going to have all these animals you've commanded us to bring with us in these barges, running around, flocks and herds in these barges, and we can't breathe. We can't empty their waste, or ours, and we can't see. We need some help. So, oh, well, I had an off day. So Jesus tells them, well, great, just cut some holes. Cut one in the top and cut one in the bottom. And if the water pours in on you, you probably should shut the hole. Yeah. And, of course, these airtight barges, tight as a dish, which would mean they would float upon the top of the ocean, are supposedly going to be submarines, though, too. They're going to be underneath, uh, traveling under the water, because the, 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 the great waves will drive them underwater. I don't think Joseph Smith knew much about oceanography or physics, I guess. Um, yeah, so, you know, any child playing in the bathtub with uh, something that has uh, air in it, maybe a little balloon or something, figures out that it takes about half a second to uh, let it go from the bottom and go to the top. It doesn't stay under there. It doesn't matter how much water you splash or pour on it. It's not going to go down and stay down. So I guess he got that part wrong. And so the Lord says cut holes in the top and the bottom. I, maybe they can empty the you know waste from the animals and themselves out the bottom and if they don't make the mistake of opening the bottom and the top then they probably won't sink when they're trying to get air and then the Lord of course forgot that they might need to be able to see something inside the bar just since they won't have windows uh, because the terrible waves will actually dash upon them and knock out the windows I suppose and uh, yeah Anyway, uh, that's okay. We'll use some magic seer stones. And they'll be, be like clear stones, and the Lord God will touch them, and then they'll just glow in the dark, just like Joseph Seer Stone did. The 19th century magic that somehow found its way into the Book of Mormon and then came out of the Book of Mormon as real uh, things. Well, the, the Urim and Thummim, the magic glasses that are also in Chapter 3 there, and I think in Chapter 12 of Ether. And then, again, there's another magic stone in in the book of uh, Alma or Messiah. I got that in another video. So he's bringing 19th century magical practices and putting them in the Book of Mormon and then claiming that he's got these magical implements like, you know, the Sword of Laban and the magic glasses uh, called uh, spectacles, interpreters, yeah. And then later we hear them called Urim and Thummim. I think Oliver Cowdery had something to do with that. And the Urim and Thummim in the Bible has got zero to do with being seer stones. Nothing. So... Jesus can't get it together. He forgets that they need light and that they need air. Or he's just giving the, a learning, growing experience. Is that what it is? I'll think of the smart things, how to design most of the boat, and then you think of the stupid things, like, hey, we need to see and breathe. And then I'll just give you really stupid sounding answers, like, why don't you cut holes in it? But what's your idea? How will you get light? I can't figure it out. You figure it out for me. And Brother Jared figures it out. Magic stones. So... Yeah, so the Lord touches the stones, and the brother Jared sees his finger, because he's got this tremendous faith. More faith than anyone's ever had in the whole history of the world, apparently. That's what Jesus tells him in verse 9. But Jesus is surprised that he sees him. And then he says, why, are you, why did you fall down? And he said, because I was scared, because I saw you, and I, I, was, you know, I thought you'd smite me for seeing your finger. Okay, so why was Jesus not aware if he knows all things, that the, the, the brother Jared saw him or was going to see him, Why, what, what, or that he'd be afraid. I mean, 
he supposedly knows all things. Even in the New Testament, it says, well, Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, why do you have these thoughts and doubts in your heart? Why think ye evil of me? Or, you know, whatever. He's reading the minds of the Pharisees and these people, but he's he can't be a mind reader uh, in, in Ether chapter 3. Apparently, he's got a problem with that. So, so then Jesus wonders if he saw more than his finger. Maybe he hadn't, you know, fully gotten dressed yet. He's running around in his uh, boxers or something, and he's a little embarrassed. I, I mean, it doesn't say that, but uh, what it does say is Jesus asks him, Hey, well, did you see any more? Is that what you say when you know all things? Jesus perceiving their thoughts when he's in mortality, but when he's God, and he's God the Father and Jesus Christ, knowing all things, has to ask the brother of Jared if he saw more, because he needs to know. Is that omniscient? Last I checked, that isn't. So, this whole theology that's put in the Book of Mormon is is just falling all over itself with contradiction. It's one thing after another, and Ether chapter 3 is rich with it. Let's get on with some more. Can't wait. I've got so many stories from the Book of Mormon that I love, so I decided to choose one. The Book of Mormon has a redactor named Moroni. And that's someone who basically compiles into a redactor. No, a, a, a redactor. Okay. So Moroni, being the prophet who who had all the plates and put them all together after they had been passed down from generation to generation, he was the last Nephite. So he's the last of his people. And I want you to imagine that being the last American. Your entire country, the country you know and love, your society is Russia just has destroyed. taken over. Russia has taken over. <laughs> And, like, like, people, like, your family, your friends, they're all dead. You're in the Everglades on a hammock tent. Oh, gosh. I would have my cat. You know, but it's just you, okay? Yeah. And I want you to think about how sad that is. And Moroni bears yeah. witness of Christ. His last words before he dies are bearing witness of Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what I love the most is the very last verse. He says, And now I bid unto all farewell. I soon go to rest in the paradise of God until my spirit and body shall again reunite and I am brought forth triumphant through the air to meet you before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah, the eternal judge of both quick and dead. Amen. That's the last verse of the Book of Mormon. But what's so beautiful about this is he says, I am brought forth triumphant through the air to meet you. To meet us. Yeah. To me what's beautiful is that he, you know, he's going to be dead soon and he's, he's speaking so personally to those thousands of years later who are going to read it. And it's also a beautiful testimony of Christ that, that the disciples, that us who follow Jesus Christ, we're connected, and we can't even be separated by time. We're going to be together for eternity, and that's just one of the most beautiful promises. I love that, and I like that he's just like, he's thinking about us and like cares about us and wants us to know, like, this is my testimony. And for me, like, if I were to put myself in his shoes, like, I'd be, like, crying. Like, I'm so sad. So I'm sad. the last one. Like, they're hunting me. I'm running for my life. Like, please don't kill me. And he doesn't. Like, he's like, let me tell you my testimony. Like, I'm worried about you instead of, like, thinking about himself. And I think that's a good application to how we should be. The Moroni we just spoke of is the same Moroni who appeared to Joseph Smith. So he's the one that the, the Lord sent him yeah. to give the place that we, he redacted to Joseph Smith. And that just gives another way to reflect upon as I'm brought forth to meet you. Yeah. You know, isn't that just the beautiful blessings that God allowed him to be the one to give this to Joseph Smith? So cool. God connects like all the scriptures. I love how like through each one of our stories, like we've been able to say like how it's connected to us. Yeah. And that's the cool thing about the Book of Mormon. Like Moroni wrote it to us. All the prophets wrote it because they knew we were going to read it. And they knew that it was going to be beneficial to us. And sometimes it's hard for me because I'm like, ah, it's the Book of Mormon. Like they the always say, read kind of it. The writing, yeah, it's hard to read sometimes. But when I sit down and like really like read it, I find myself so much happier. And I always find something. It so let's keep tying it together. What are they doing? What are they doing? Keep, they keep showing us that the Book of Mormon very Christian, it unites you with Jesus Christ. They're hipsters, it's cool, it's full of cool stories for cool people like them. And and, and their whole wall and decoration, everything about them is is, is saying, you know, these guys they they're, they're just they're really they're really cool. It's cool to be a Mormon Christian. The Book of Mormon adds to the Bible uh Great stories. They're 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 more interesting. They're fun. They're new. They can add to your spiritual testimony. The Bible and the Book of Mormon complement each other. Did they get to that part yet? 
you know. But um, what about the historicity of the things that they're saying? They're saying that, hey, isn't it awesome that, you know, Moroni is talking to us? He's talking to, to us because he knew that we would really be benefited by this. The Book of Mormon says it's written especially to the Lamanites to bring them back to the truth. The Book of Mormon testifies of Jesus Christ, even though it starts doing that 2200 BC, long before Greek is invented, so <clears throat> no wonder there's nothing about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Language didn't exist, but apparently it did for the Book of Mormon guys. And then the great Jehovah will come. We will be judged at the bar of the great Jehovah, or whatever he said. This is Moroni, maybe around 400 AD is whether they have this. But Jehovah wasn't invented until the 13th century AD by a Catholic priest. The name wasn't even Jehovah then yet, really. It was, you know, Jehovah or something. And so I've gone over this, some of these details in, 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 in like my Book of Abraham stuff or in the, you know, prove, uh, you know, the LDS scriptures are proven. That's about, a, you know, an hour video or so, an hour, hour and 20, whatever it is. So many scriptures in that and documenting where things come from, like the name Jehovah replacing the titles of Adonai and Elohim, which the Jews referred to Yahweh as because it was irreverent to use his name, so they just used those titles, meaning the gods are my Lord. And some Catholic priest combines the names and makes up something that kind of Latinizes it, and the anglicized, Latinized version winds up becoming Jehovah. Tyndale puts it in the Bible, what, around 15th, 16th century. Joseph Smith picks it up there, and somehow thinks that it's uh, an ancient actual name. So he's got it in the Book of Mormon and he's got it in the Book of Abraham. Completely anachronistic. Like saying Abraham had a cell phone. It's like saying Moroni was on his laptop. I mean, sorry. The name didn't exist and it came from the Church of the Devil. Sorry, Joseph Smith. Stumbled on your own words again. Hey, they make a really big deal about Moroni bringing the gospel, bringing the Book of Mormon, presenting it to Joseph Smith and all that. But maybe I'll leave it to the end of this. I'm going to actually, you know, I'm going to do shoot a little video footage because actually it wasn't Moroni. It was Nephi. Time after time after time, Joseph Smith has it as Nephi. He's got it as Nephi in the Times and Seasons. He's got it as Nephi in the Pearl of Great Price. Orson Pratt is, or Pratt or Hyde, one of the, one of the two, I think it's Orson Pratt. Is He's quoting Joseph in the Millennial Star. In Britain, same story. He was a messenger from the presence of God and his name was Nephi. Lucy Mack, Joseph's mother, in her, uh, you know, in, in her writings, her memoirs or whatever, it's Nephi. It's always, it, actually it isn't always Nephi. There were about two instances in between 1835 and 1838 or something where, where Moroni was actually mentioned. And then after that it was always Nephi again until Joseph Smith was dead and Orson Pratt changed it. It appears it was Orson Pratt, and, you know, BYU papers even say it was Orson Pratt that changed it in the original Joseph Smith manuscript of the history of the church. It's lined out. Nephi is lined out. Someone if different handwriting writes in Moroni above Nephi. They didn't have erasers, they didn't have word processors. The evidence was there. <laughs> I'll show some of that. It was uh, just more evidence that Joseph Smith just kept changing his story. Whether it's about what God is, who God is, who the Godhead is, what LDS theology is. This is the Book of Mormon the theology, which is biblical, well, Christianity, which is New Testament. I mean, they're discussing New Testament topics in the Book of Mormon. They're quoting New Testament text, you know, arguments, phrases, quotes out of the New Testament before, in the story before, you know, Peter, Paul, John, before these guys even were born, you know, but they're being quoted. 
it doesn't say they're quoting them. It just uses the exact words or very similar words that they've got in the New Testament. You're like, hey, I've read this somewhere before. Yeah. It's all kinds of evidence in there that says, hey, this is a 19th century book. These are 19th century topics. It's, it's you know, whether it's about, you know, justice, mercy versus, you know, justice or faith versus works or whatever the hot topics were or Freemasonry and the Illuminati, you know, and when you're reading about the secret combinations that, you know, it was the hot topic, you know, one of Joseph Smith's mistresses there, Mrs. Harris, formerly Mrs. William Morgan, who was a Mason who revealed many of their signs, tokens, passwords, keywords, penalties, and was murdered by the Masons for revealing them as they covenant to do and as Joseph Smith brought into the temple which is now pretty much out of the temple endowment but the uh, Freemason William Morgan was killed for the sake of the oath which Joseph Smith wrote into chapter 5 of Moses so um, these are all hot topics Israelites uh, coming and turning into American Indians you know they're a lost tribe of Israel book of the Hebrews you know a view of the Hebrews published by Oliver Cowdery's pastor a few years before Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery published the Book of Mormon. Just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. You know, that, so that whole theme's in the Book of Mormon. All these hot topics of the day just happen to be in the Book of Mormon. Plus the magic, the seer stones, all the stuff that Joseph Smith's already been doing and his treasure seeking and necromancy and all that kind of stuff. Well, they, yeah, well, they got, you know, witchcraft, curses and magic and all kinds of stuff mentioned in the Book of Mormon, but they got the all kinds of magic stones, whether they're the glow-in-the-dark stones to keep the buds light, whether it's the glow-in-the-dark, you know, stone to, that'll shine forth and bring the acts of darkness to light in Alma, that seer stone, or whether it's the magic glasses in the Book of Ether to translate ancient records, it all is so similar to what Joseph Smith was doing with the stone in the hat since he was about 14 years old. So, Nephi, Moroni, yeah, it's not a it, it's it's it, it's not a typographical error. Joseph Smith was the editor of the what Times and Seasons. He published that in 1842. Never changed it. Never changed it. And we've got multiple publications. So his mom believed it was Nephi. He said it was Nephi. I mean, you know, Larson Pratt said it's Nephi. <laughs> now it's Moroni. Yeah. There was a book put out. I think, uh, or the Tanners. What was it called? The Changing World of Mormonism? Pretty good title. Yeah, because so much just keeps on changing for the God who changes not. Well, let's get back to it, then we'll wind it up shortly. These three are really doing a job of pitching Mormonism as an expanded, cool way to add on to your Christianity the excitement of the Book of Mormon which testifies of Jesus Christ, and we've got that Kwaku has testified that it's true. And don't listen to your parents, don't listen to your friends, listen to the Holy Spirit. Read the stories. If you feel good, it's true. Don't worry about the facts. That's what Dallin Oaks tells us in the seminary manual. Don't worry about the facts. We don't depend on facts. Any, any combination of facts, historical facts, mean nothing to us. We have the Holy Spirit. People that are worthy depend on the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost witnesses to you that that's all true if you're worthy. If you're not getting that witness, you're evidently not worthy. Don't pay attention to the facts. They're just here to distract you. Satan makes up facts, right? Good Lord. Always. I love it. I want to say to all those watching who are not members of the church, the Book of Mormon is true. And let me also add, the Book of Mormon helps you appreciate and understand the Bible even more. I can read the Bible. As the and Bible helps yes. you understand the Book of Mormon. Oh, of course, they, yeah. they complement each other. Yeah. But there, there are so many who are going to be like, I got to read the whole Bible before I read the Book of Mormon. <laughs> no, you can start reading the Book of Mormon today and you will have a greater appreciation for the Bible. The Book of Mormon true. is the Word of God, yeah. period. If you go into the Book of Mormon, like reading it, thinking like, I'm going to prove these Mormons wrong. Like, I'm going to find everything wrong with their book. You're going to find whatever you want wrong with it. Yeah. But if you're going into it thinking like, okay, I really genuinely want to know, is this true or is it not true? Yep. And you ask. It's like if, if you really want to get to know someone, 
you, you don't walk up to them and be like, oh, man, their, their eyebrows are funny. Or like, oh, man, why are they wearing that plaid shirt with those striped pants? Like, you don't, you don't think these things and gain a good relationship with that person. Yeah. That's not going to happen. If you want to really have a solid relationship with someone, get to know them as they truly are. Read the Book of Mormon without any preconcept mm -hmm. of what it should be. Yes. Read the Book of Mormon for what it is. So before before my Mormon days, kicking it as a young little Protestant, um, I uh, whenever we were speaking to people who weren't Christian or speaking of people who weren't Christian, such as Hindus, um, we it, we never said, "Hey, read the Bible to see if this is true," or to somebody who's an atheist, it's never like, "Read the Bible to to gain a testimony to see if this is true." It was always just like, "This is true," and that's that. But there was no like, "See for yourself to find yeah. out." And so if even if you're not a Latter Day Saint. We are offering you and hoping that you read this book, that you read the Book of Mormon, and that you find out for yourself. It doesn't matter what, what we say. Your, it doesn't matter what we, it doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't yeah. matter what you know your parents say, your friends. Again, the Book of Mormon it just complements the Bible. It makes the Bible more clear because uh, all those added insights from those 19th century arguments about you know grace and works and all that sort of a thing and and. Uh, the things that are done in these stories and, and, and so forth to really bring out Christian messages or messages that Joseph Smith or Moroni, if you believe that, wanted to uh, bring out. Yeah. And, and of course, we want to say that the Bible complements the Book of Mormon, too. Ian brings that in there because we don't want to give the image that Mormons value the Book of Mormon more than the Bible. That's an image we're trying to lose because we're, we're Christians. We're Christians and we're all about the Bible and the Bible and the Book of Mormon are buddies. We're cool and you can have these cool news stories and be cool like us, but you got to have the right attitude. Because if you go into this thing thinking you're going to find something wrong with it, you will. Really? Do, do the facts actually change? No, they don't actually change. They, the facts are what the facts are, but if facts don't matter, and it's all about how you feel, then then your attitude really does matter in that case, then I suppose, huh? Then it's all about you have to want to believe. In fact, if you don't go in there wanting to believe, there's something wrong with you. You're actually prejudiced. You're prejudiced against the Book of Mormon. You got a bad attitude. You don't have faith. And you know what? That's the same message that's preached in the Book of Mormon. In Moroni chapter 10, verses say three through five or so, we read, First, you've got to believe that God is super merciful, and he always has been. Which means you have a really lousy memory or you didn't read the Old Testament. Next, you've got to believe in Jesus Christ. Which, of course, it's preaching long before, you know, the time that Jesus Christ was supposed to have lived. And in a language, you know, Greek, which didn't exist. So, that's great. But if you don't, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, then you're sunk. Well, so great. And it's written to the Lamanites. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. What do they believe in? The Great Spirit? Well, that's what it says in, like, uh, Alma. The Great Spirit. Yeah, it's using 19th century words that they used to communicate with the American Indians over their deities. Great. Such a coincidence. So they were calling him the Great Spirit back in the times of uh, Ammon, huh? Yeah. So you got to already believe in Jesus Christ, or, or you can't have, you, you won't get the Book of Mormon because you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. So, if it's if, if believing in Jesus Christ, having faith in Jesus Christ, is a prerequisite to having a knowledge that the book is true, it's complete circular reasoning. It's ridiculous like everything that's in it. In the name of the Age of Reason, dedicated to exposing these shills for the church, funded, according to Thinker of Thoughts, by basically a church-controlled asset. Yeah. The more good foundation. How about the more fraud foundation? Later, guys. So there we go again. I want to throw in a quick observation. Kwaku pulls a, uh, a nice little sales pitch subtlety there. He says, so while I was kicking it as a cool little Protestant or whatever. So what is he saying there? 
well, he, he was kicking it, so that means, you know, he, he's a hipster, he's cool, right? He shows a picture. And uh, he was a Protestant, he was a Christian, but he went from being a Protestant Christian to a Mormon Christian. Subtle and effective. And he's cool, and he did it, so, you know, it's cool for you to do that, too. So most of the material is still on the Dodger Game channel. i got about 150 videos over there. It's like ones you're looking at right here, understanding Mormon astrotheology, etc. All sorts of things. Gordon B. Hinckley. You know, everything. But uh, new stuff and some of the best ones are up on the Mormon Truth channel now. Well, what I got, like 15 videos there or so. So um, they're coming on. I'm trying to put the very best stuff on here with the channel that matches. You know, the name matches the content. However, uh, feel free to use buff. See in the comments. You saw it on the Mormon Truth video channel. The Mormon Truth video channel, not the Mormon Fraud video channel that these guys are actually promoting. Amen! Like, subscribe, comment! Just keep it clean.